Hello, everyone, and welcome to NBIO's latest webinar on food allergy diagnostics and reducing uncertainty. Really appreciate everyone taking time out of their busy schedules to join us and uh, excited to present this important information. We've got a great lineup of speakers today. We'll be starting with Dr. Martin Chapman, President and CEO of NBIO. Uh, Martin is going to be speaking to the significance of recent food allergy extract recalls as well as InBio's multifaceted approach to allergen standardization. Following Martin, we'll have Dr. Anna Pumez, Research Director at InBio. Anna will be speaking to human IgE monoclonal antibodies. Uh, these are exclusive and unique to InBio for research and diagnostic purposes. Uh, Anna will be uh, covering the latest research uh, on these, which includes structures, basophil mediator release testing, as well as mouse anaphylaxis models. Following Anna, we'll have Dr. Sabina Wunschman. Sabina is VP of Allergen Manufacturing and R&D at InBio. And Sabina will be speaking to InBio's purified allergens. Uh, that product line includes food protein standards, as well as molecular reference standard, uh, material, excuse me. Um, Sabina will be speaking directly of how these can assist diagnostic manufacturers. And I'm Beatty Sturgill, Senior Business Development Manager with InBio, and I'll be helping um, moderate uh, the webinar and discussion today. So the learning objectives of today's webinar is going to be to discuss the significance and data behind the recent food extract recalls, as well as cover uh, InBio's multifaceted approach to allergen standardization. This approach includes uh, immunoassays, mass spectrometry, human IgE monoclonal antibodies, as well as protein standards. Another goal of the webinar is to, gonna, is to be to understand the latest research and applications of human IgE monoclonal antibodies, uh, as well as the use of purified allergens, specifically the food protein standards and their use and impact in diagnostics. Following the, web, uh, the completion of the webinar, we'll have a discussion and Q&A section Feel free to post questions anytime during the webinar by clicking the button and you can type your question in there and we'll get uh, as many uh, questions addressed as we can uh, at, at the close of the webinar. But with that, I'll turn it over uh, to Martin. Great, Beatty, thanks very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to echo Beatty and um, uh, thank everyone for joining us on this webinar today. Um, my um, um, brief here is to discuss how insights and perspective into the recent food allergen diagnostic product recalls. Last year, there was tremendous excitement in the uh, food allergy field, be largely because of the release of the Molecular Allergology User's Guide. There was certainly a lot of excitement about that, about the use of molecular diagnostics. This year had been somewhat of a setback. Um, primarily because of the uh, peanut allergen recalls um, um, that of skin test diagnostic products. In December 2022, uh, the FDA and ALK uh, voluntarily withdrew four lots of peanut extract because of increased reports of false negative skin test results um, and subsequent adverse reactions, including some anaphylactic reactions in patients who suddenly went on to consume or otherwise be exposed to peanuts. Next slide, please. This was followed in March of this year by the FDA then requiring a warning about false negative food allergen skin test results um, about the potential for anaphylactic reactions if in false negative with false negative reactions. And they applied this to all food allergen extracts. The at the same time, the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, and the American College. Um, uh, responded with concern that all food extracts should be labeled uh, in this manner and that it was unnecessary. And this, I think, was given the long history of um, um, diagnostic efficacy using skin test products. Um, they said that the new label statement could be applied to food serum IgE testing, which I'm not quite sure about, but that the labeling could result in over-testing, over-diagnosis, and reduced quality of care. And they requested um, further discussions with FDA concerning these statements. And we're not sure about what the current status of those discussions is. Um, but the FDA um, position proved to be profound because last month in September, um, the um, 
ALK again withdraw, withdrew, voluntarily withdrew pecan nut extracts for the same reasons. Increased reports of false negative skin tests and one reported case of life-threatening anaphylaxis from subsequent peanut exposure. So um, over the um, um, over the course of the summer, working with Cosby Stone and John Hemmler, uh, Cosby Stones at Vanderbilt and John Hemmler at UVA, they uh, obtained a couple of batches of the recall lots and compared them with the non-recall lots from ALK on skin testing in a group of allergic patients. And what this slide shows in the red is the mean wheel diameter of the recall lots, four millimeter wheel plus or minus three millimeters versus the non-recall lots, um, which were 14 millimeters plus or minus 11. I'd like to draw your particular attention to a couple of patients in orange and in green that had negative reaction to the recall lots, but then had a 14 millimeter wheel and a 36 millimeter wheel respectively when skin tested with the non-recall lots. And I'd also like just to throw in that this 36 millimeter wheel is actually a very high level of skin test response. And we'll, and we'll get back to that later. Next slide, please. Um, at the same time, um, Scott Smith um, has made a panel of human IgE monoclonal antibodies to peanut allergens, to all four peanut allergens, and he was able to use pairs of these antibodies to compare the recall lots with non-recall lots um, in, in these immunoassays. And you can see from these dilution curves that the recall lots, which are indicated in red and in purple on these uh, graphs, um, were shifted pr um, profoundly to the right compared to the allergen reactivity of the non-recall lots. So if you look at the red curves and the, and the purple curves there, you can see they shifted extensively to the right. Um, and in some cases, they didn't get positive reactions or only achieved positive reactions of very low dilutions of extracts of the order of one in 10. Next slide, please. Well, Stephanie Phillip um, at InBio analyzed a lot using the InBio quantitative ELISAs for ARH1, 2, 3, and 6. The recall lots are indicated by R on this slide. And you can see that these two recall lots contained either undetectable allergen or negligible amounts of allergen between 1 to 4 micrograms per ml. Uh, the non-recall lots um, um, contained detectable allergen. And what's what's interesting about this is that they contain predominantly ARH2 and ARH6, as indicated in green, and really very small amounts of ARH1 and ARH3. Well, we ran these extracts on an SDS page gel. Next slide. Um, and this um, shows you that the recall lots indicated on the left as R5 and R6 um, contained barely detectable protein when compared to non-recall lots, um, 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 as, as indicated on the slide. Now, the yellow there um, on those particular lots indicates that these were three, so the samples were also tested by mass spec and gave us very similar, uh, similar results in terms of the relative abundance of peanut proteins. Next slide. So <clears throat> we wondered about why um, the ARH2 and ARH6 were so enriched, so enriched. In, the, in, the ALK, um, in the ALK extracts. And we, we thought they could have been processed in some way to enrich for ARH2 and ARH6. So we analyzed a couple of other extracts, one from Low Pharma and one from Stalish and Greer. And you can see from this slide that these extracts gave similar reactivity, very highly enriched for ARH2 and ARH6, very low levels of RH1 and RH3. We compared those with other peanut proteins. In bio, produces a peanut protein. We looked at Bamba, we looked at PB2. And you can see that those extracts have more, if you like, more consistent profiles. And Bamba and PB2 are um, distinguished by their ability to have very high levels of RH3 compared to the other three allergens. And we published, um, we have published some of this data. Next slide, please. Um, we uh, also repeated some of the assays with the IgE monoclonal antibodies, and you can a slightly different format to Scott Smith. And you can see from this slide that there's a very good quantitative correlation, whether one uses immunoassays measuring murin IgG or human IgE. Next slide. 
So <clears throat> the, our approach to standardization is multifaceted. It relies on biochemical an analyses of the actual proteins using SDS page and other techniques, immunoassays for precise measurement of specific allergens in an immunoreactive form. This could be ELISA or multiplex immunoassays such as Maria or Maria for Foods. Mass spectrometry um, is another important tool. And again, one can use this for detecting multiple allergens. Human IgE monoclonal antibodies we've mentioned. And some products, for example, um, uh, virus-like particles containing allergen sequences would probably require customized methods for standardization. Important thing here is that the standardization is based on measuring specific allergens, which are the active pharmaceutical ingredient of food allergen um, extracts. So um, I want to give you some examples of this. This is a recent example of study that we published last year on major peanut allergens in early introduction foods. This was food puffs. And you can see the three samples in the graph here, BAMBA, ERD, and MME contained high levels of um, um, the RH1, 2, 3, and 6, whereas the SFO sample, we did, were un unable to detect these allergens in that, in that kind of food puff. And if we looked at SDS page, the BAMBA and ERD and MME showed almost identical molecular pr uh, uh, profiles, whereas the SFO puff looked, looked um, significantly degraded on this particular gel. Next slide. We've also looked at allergen levels in reference materials, and I'm just showing you one example here. This is NIST food reference materials. They produce reference materials for milk, egg, soy, peanut butter, and hazelnut. And this was a Maria assay where we measured, I think, nine allergens. And you can see that the allergen content in terms of specific allergens correlates with the, with the particular reference material. And this, if appropriately validated, those measurements could be used as a, those standards could be used as a major allergen um, uh, uh, standard material. Next slide. <clears throat> mass spectrometry, we use mass spectrometry for uh, purity assessment of allergen molecules. It's also been used for absolute quantification of individual allergens such as BET-V1. Um, and it's very useful for looking at the re relative abundance of allergens, particularly in processed foods. Um, and it, another um, point of note is that uh, it's being considered by regulator authorities such as the FDA and the Paul Ehrlich Institute. And indeed, Yelena Spirik, Andreas Reuter and Ron Rabin published a very nice review of this um, from those agencies um, in 2017. The big question with mass spec, is it ready for pri is it prime time and can it be um, consistently applied to allergen measurements? Next slide. Well, I'm going to preface the introduction of the human IgE antibodies here. Um, these uh, antibodies were raised by Scott Smith um, from a series of allergic donors with symptomatic um, allergic symptoms, asthma, atopic dermatitis, eosinophic e e e esophagitis, and food allergy. Interestingly, the majority of these patients were children aged 3 to 13, and through a series of B-cell enrichment steps and IgE measurements and specific allergen assays, Scott was able to derive 33 monoclonal antibodies in the series that, that um, uh, were licensed to in bio uh, from food and inhalant allergens and alpha-gal. And they were assessed for purity, potency, specificity, and also biological activity, which uh, um, Anna Pomeus is going to speak about um, um, in the next presentation. Next slide. Um, these antibodies were just recently published in Frontiers in Allergy. Next slide. And so what should be the future priorities for allergen standardization? First of all, it's been 20 years or more of, of incredible research on food allergens, but um, we still don't have standardized food allergen reference materials um, that can be used and validated for clinical use. And so standardization and peanut and other food allergens is a high priority. Developing simplified assays, immunoassays is also important. Um, and definitely we need validated mass spectrometry methods because these have not been tested in any validated uh, multi-center ring trials. 
Um, there are other in vitro measurements for assessment of biological potency, such as the BAT techniques, um, which I think also um, can be part of this. And also, ideally, one would want to get fast track processes for standards uh, and measurement methods uh, to speed regulatory approval. So I am going to finish there and um, hand over to uh, Dr. Anna Pomeas to continue the discussion of standardization using human IgE antibodies. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Next, um, Beni, I'll be pleased to talk to um, you about the human IG standards. And the importance of those standards has been recognized for a long time. Either they can be used as reference materials for research or as for diagnosis and allergen standardization. In fact, those two articles are from 1985 and they highlight the issues associated with allergen standardization. The, the article on the right shows standardization of human of uh, house dust mite from dermatophagoid steronicinus. And to help doing that, a, a new reference pool of CIRA from patients allergic to this mite was established by the National Institute of Biological Standards and Control. So this is standard, next slide. This is standard is a mixture of 10 CIRA from different patients that are highly allergic to deuteronicinus. So they made this mix mixture that was 900 ml. And then when this became a WHO international standard, it was aliquoted in little glass ampules, a, a 0.9 ml um, aliquots, and that was used for a long time. However, this standard is no longer available. Next. So what are the challenges for generating human IG standards? One of them is that there is a very limited source of CIRA from allergic subjects. And the IG antibodies are in low amount in the, in the blood, in nanogram per ml uh, concentration. Uh, there is subject variability of this polyclonal IG antibody response. So a key goal in the allergy field has always been to have a consistent source of human IG for research and also for standardization purposes. So some recent developments uh, that I'm going to show you uh, may improve uh, to reach this goal, reaching this goal. Next, please. So uh, um, we have been collaborating for a few years now with Dr. Scott Smith at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, who has developed a hybridoma technology to produce human Ig monoclonal antibodies. So PBMCs are isolated from patients and the B cells are expanded in culture for about one week. And then the, I, the cells in wells that produce Ig are fused with a myeloma partner to by uh, electrical cytofusion. And the hybridomas are selected with hat media and then further purified by flow cytometry. So at this point, the specificity of those Ig antibodies is not known. So we need to screen all those antibodies for binding to different allergens. Next. So we have now identified quite a high number of, um, of um, Ig monoclonal antibodies that have several different specificities. And in fact, for some of them, we have several antibodies, as you can see, for, for example, for Rh2 and Rp2 or Feldy1. And those are very interesting pools that we have been doing research for the last years that's funded by the NIH. And I'm gonna show you what uh, the research is about. Next one. So the research is in the context of determining antigenic determinants of our epitopes in asthma-associated allergens. And the main reason is that there is very limited knowledge of IgE epitopes on allergens associated with the human repertoire. So the main goal is to identify and analyze IgE antibody binding epitopes, and the information obtained can be subsequently used for design of hypoallergens and also to better understand the human Ig repertoire. Next, please. So over the years, we have done a lot of uh, crystallographic studies by, by determining the structure of allergens in complex with fragments of murine IgG antibodies that were used as surrogates of Ig. And now we have those IgE that are human Ig with the correct pairing of the heavy and light chain because they originate from B cells of allergic patients. And this is the first structure we have ever obtained um, of an allergen, in this case, therp 2 from mite, and an IgE 
monoclonal antibody FAB 2F10. That's a specific for the RP2. You can see at the bottom in, ma in magenta, the epitope that is very well defined on the molecule of the RP2. Next, please. So more recently, we identified another IgE for C8 that also binds the P2 at a site that is non-overlapping with the epitope for 2F10. And we have also, uh, in the past, identified an epitope for a murine IgG monoclonal antibody 7A1. So we have clearly three epitopes in the P2 that have been identified by X-ray crystallography now. And we wanted to further analyze these interactions. Next one, please. So we've put uh, these, uh, we analyzed the area of those epitopes uh, from these two IgEs that you can see in yellow, compared to all the other uh, complexes of allergen with antibodies, most of them murine IgGs. Here in Salmon, you can see BOSD5, FLOP2, those two are IgEs from combinatorial libraries uh, that um, have a combination of heavy and light change, which is, which is not as certain as the one for monoclonal antibodies. And in green, those are uh, murine IgG, but all the other ones are mostly IgGs. So what you can see is that there is a good correlation between the epitope area and the number of residues forming the epitopes. And the IgGs are within the range of what we see for IgGs. There's no reason to, to think that, uh, to expect any other way that AG and IgG would be different structure. Next one, please. So we did the mutagenesis analysis to really identify the specific residues that are involved in those epitopes. So by mutating between one and three residues, we could eliminate the binding of the antibody. And I'm showing here some results for the 2F10 epitope mutant that is in orange, and it had a reduced capacity to inhibit the binding of Ig to the allergen compared to the wild type. And that was uh, the case for the 10 uh, different uh, patients that we analyzed. So that indicates that really this 2F10 epitope is dominant in this population. We did the same for 4C8 and also was dominant for all those patients that we tested. So those are important um, epitopes uh, in the IG repertoire of those patients. And that's interesting to um, think as for planning to design a vaccine for the future. Next one, please. Then we wanted to also know if functionally those uh, mutants were able to induce or not mast cell release. So we have a passive model of uh, anaphylaxis in mouse. And those mice are uh, transgenic, expressing human FC epsilon R1 receptor. So their cells, mast cells, are acting like human mast cells. So we can sensitize the mice by uh, administering at least two different Ig monoclonal antibodies. And then um, the, when the mice are challenged with the wild type allergen, in this case the P2, we can see mast cell release as a decrease in body temperature of those mice, uh, which is an indication of anaphylaxis. However, next please, if we use, instead of the wild type, the 2F10 epitope mutant, next, we don't get a mast cell release. And that shows us this plot, uh, the red uh, plot, that indicates lack of anaphylaxis uh, when the epitope mutant is used for challenging. So th this experiment really indicates the the structural basis of anaphylaxis in vivo. Next, please. We also did some experiments to prove the capacity of those antibodies to sensitize RBL cells uh, to induce the granulation of an allergen challenge. And we did that for, with 32, FLD1, and H2, as you can see here. And we have recently published that study. And next one. Another thing we wanted to know for standardization purposes is how those IgEs compare with human IgE. And so we pulled several of those uh, monoclonal antibodies and then compared them with serum pools with inhibition assays than in immunocap. And, and you can see that both the pools of human Ig monoclonal antibodies and the serum pool from patients behave very similarly when the inhibitor is either Hausdasmite extract or peanut extract. 
as you can see, the pools of IG monoclonal antibodies were done with anti-DRP1 and anti-DRP2 IGEs for the mite um, experiment, and then anti-RH1 and anti-RH2 for the peanut experiment. So again, this uh, experiment is interesting because it shows that uh, these pools of human IG monoclonal antibodies might be able to replace the human pools that are more difficult. Next, please. So we have a large panel now of different human IG monoclonal antibodies with different specificities, as you can see here for nine foot allergens, four inhaled allergens, alpha-gal. Next, please. What is really interesting is that because they are human, they are um, obtained from hybridomas, we can obtain high amounts. So you can see here for most of them, it is at least 30,000 kilo units per liter. And, you know, when a person is highly allergic to one of those allergens, usually it could be around 100. So really we can obtain amounts that are high enough to be able to make pools that could be in the future used for standardization. So there is a great promise for those um, IG monoclonal antibodies for IG standardization. So next one, just to wrap up, uh, as I showed you the allergen specific human IG monoclonal antibodies that were obtained by hybridoma technology are biologically function functional and they have allowed us to perform very detailed structural IG epitope analysis. The interactions between those antibodies and the allergen in this case, that would be to define the structural basis of anaphylaxis in vivo, as I showed you in those mouse uh, uh, experiments. And analysis of human IG conformational epitopes, as I showed you for their P2, using those antibodies will contribute to understand how the human, human IG repertoire works. And finally, pools of human IG monoclonal antibodies can potentially replace human CIRA for either potency assessment of immunotherapy extracts in standardization protocols, and also as IG reference standards for diagnosis and research. Next, I want to thank the people involved in all these studies, especially Jill Glesner and Alice Sabol at InBio, in Vanderbilt, Scott Smith for generating those antibodies, Max Cruz at MSU for leaving the crystallographic analysis, Ronald Van Rie in Amsterdam for uh, these uh, comparisons of the pools by Immunocap, and then uh, Lorenza Glass for testing the biological activity of those antibodies. And finally, I want to strongly thank the NIH and IEAD for the R01 to InBio that's supporting all these studies. And thank you very much for listening. Great. Thanks, Anna. Yes. Uh, appreciate that talk. And with that, we can turn it over to Sabina, who will be discussing in bios purified allergens in their use and impact in diagnostics. Thank you, Becky. Next slide. So linking back to um, Martin's slide on the multifaceted approach um, of allergen standardization at in bio, I want to touch uh, on three of these aspects mentioned. First, the biochemical analysis, as Martin mentioned, um, we uh, use it to run SDS page, but the main use is really um, to characterize and validate the purified allergen products uh, that we develop um, to ensure their efficacy and their stability uh, as a product, as a purified allergen product. The use of mass spec as a tool has been um, proven to be invaluable for allergen manufacturing at Embio. While the main purpose is that we uh, validate high purity of the allergen uh, products, we also use it to uh, evaluate the quality of our um, source materials that we use to purify natural allergens from. We use it to assess the uh, uh, allergen composition of allergen extracts. And it's a great aid um, that helps us to develop purification strategies for new allergens. And finally, um, we have a new product line of uh, food protein standards that have a defined allergen composition. And that is just one exam additional example of um, use of standardization based on measuring the actual active ingredients that, that purify uh, the allergens in uh, an extract or a standard. Next slide. 
So manufacturing of purified allergens at Enbio happens exclusively at our uh, Salisbury, Virginia uh, headquarter location. And this is a picture of our main lab in Charlottesville. The allergen manufacturing um, is happening under ISO 9001-2015 certification. And the um, purified allergens are validated for IgE binding, for purity, and for stability. Applications of these purified allergens include molecular allergy diagnostics and allergy research. Next slide. So overall, we are by now purifying over 100 different um, allergen products from food, dust mite, cockroach, animals, pollen, venom, and mold. And they belong to our three main product categories, which are natural allergens, recombinant allergens, and low-tox allergens, which can be either natural or recombinant allergens. Next slide. As I already mentioned, we have developed a new product line of food protein standards. These reagents have a lower endotoxin level and are derived from food source materials such as peanut flour. They are manufactured under ISO 9001 certification. And as I mentioned, they have a defined allergen composition that we measure by ELISA or by mass spec using relative abundance levels. These uh, food protein standards are validated also for IgE binding and their stability is monitored. The food protein standards have applications in allergen standardization where we can use them as reference materials to standardize allergy diagnostics for foods, or they can be used in preclinical R&D of uh, development of food allergy therapeutics. Next slide. These are just two examples of these food protein standards. On the left-hand side is the um, peanut food protein standard. The allergen composition of the peanut standard is validated by ELISA using InBio's peanut allergen-specific ELISA assays, and the total protein concentration is determined by BCA. On the right-hand side is our hazelnut um, food protein standard. The allergen composition of this standard is validated by mass spec using relative abundance levels for each detected hazelnut allergen. And again, the total protein concentration is determined by BCA. Next. So we have developed um, three uh, food protein standards so far for peanut, hazelnut, and pistachio. And we are um, developing additional food protein standards with a defined allergen composition for soy, pea flour, almond, cashew, and wheat. So look out for those over the next few months. Next slide. So in addition to standardized um, allergen extracts, there's also a need for uh, standardized uh, purified allergens. Um, as part of the CREATE project, uh, a few candidate allergens were identified and which were later on characterized during the BSB90 project. But really only two purified allergen reference materials have emerged. They're available through the European Pharmacopoeia uh, for BATV1 and floppy 5 a Next slide. So we have uh, aimed to develop uh, a set of four dust mite molecular reference standards, which can be used to standardize uh, dust mite allergy diagnostics and therapeutics. We developed DERF1, DERF2, and DERF1 and DERF2 um, natural allergen reference standards. Next slide. We did this in collaboration with Dr. Peter Breitzer from the University of Salzburg who did extensive work analyzing the isoform composition of DERP1 and DERP2. In this example of DERP2, he analyzed the isoforms using intact mass and diagnostic peptides. And he found that the predominant isoform in natural DERP2 is DERP20110 and DERP20101. Next slide. He also looked at the isoform dis distribution in mite extract, which we use as source material to, to purify the natural DERP2. And he found that the isoform distribution in the mite extract, source material, and the purified DERP2 is nearly identical, which suggests that we don't selectively enrich certain isoforms during our purification strategy of the natural DERP2. Next slide. 
The natural DOP1 and the DOP2 have excellent uh, IgE reactivity and ELISA using sera of um, mitoallergic individuals. And it also correlated very well with their recombinant counterpart, recombinant DOP1 on the left-hand side and DOP2 on the right-hand side. Next. We validate the purity of the natural DOP2 in this case and the other dust mite allergens as well. Um, by SES page, um, for the DOP2 in this example, it shows a single band at about 14 kilo Dalton. And by using mass spec on the left-hand side, we got an excellent sequence coverage for natural DOP2 and no contamination with other dust mite allergens by mass spec. Next slide. We also validated the stability of the lyophilized natural DOP2 by SDS page. There was no sign of degradation after one year and uh, ELISA response curves um, were um, superimposed after one year compared to the to when the extract, uh, when the natural DOP2 was made. Sorry. Next. So the molecular reference standards for dust mites that were developed are based on highly purified natural dust mite allergens that are manufactured under ISIN certification. They're validated for their purity, for IgE binding and monoclonal antibody binding, and for stability. These allergens are formulated as uh, lyophilized allergens uh, and are dispensed at 10 microgram per sealed glass vial. We measured the protein concentration for these uh, reference standards by amino acid analysis. These standards have applications for the determination of potency of vaccines and the validation of molecular IgE diagnostics. And having developed this, um, these processes for uh, the dust mite uh, molecular reference standards, this can now also be applied to um, for future molecular reference standards which we plan to develop for peanut and other food allergens. Next slide. So in summary, ISO 9001 certified bioprocessing pathways have been established to yield high purity mite allergens with hom homogeneous isoform profiles. The established bioprocessing pathways can now be adapted to develop peanut and other food allergen molecular reference standards. The food protein standards that I presented and the future molecular reference standards may then serve as reference materials to facilitate standardization and harmonization of food allergen diagnostic products. And I want to thank again, Dr. Peter Britzer from the University of Salzburg for the isoform composition work that he did for the DOP1 and DOP2. With that, uh, I thank you for your attention and I'll turn it back to Beatty. Great, thanks Sabina and thanks to Martin and Anna as well for uh, your great presentations. Uh, you know, from this webinar, it's clear that there's an urgent need for standardization of food, allergen extracts, uh, and in summary, NBio has the tools and resources to assist uh, diag diagnostic manufacturers in that need. As mentioned, that includes our multifaceted approach to allergen standardization. Uh, we offer amino assay services as well as kits that include our ELISA 2.0 kits, which are pre-coded plates and our Maria multiplexing technology. We have mass spec capabilities to help characterize samples, as well as human IgE monoclonal antibodies and purified allergens. The human IgE monoclonal antibodies uh, are unique and exclusive to NBio for research and diagnostic purposes. Uh, and as Anna mentioned, they're derived from allergic patients with a clinical history of allergic diseases. Uh, these uh, human IgE monoclonal antibodies uh, serve as diverse research and diagnostic applications. And with our food purified allergens, Sabina mentioned that those are uh, certified under an ISO 9001 quality management system and include uh, the new food protein standards uh, that we have released and continue uh, to develop here at InBio. But with that, we can turn it over uh, to the discussion section, and we'll work through as many questions as we can in the remaining time. Again, ask that you post any questions using the Q&A button. Uh, but with that, we'll turn it over to the questions. Martin, got a first question for you here. Uh, subjects that reacted severely 
were they sensitized to two S albumins, RH2 and RH6? This is back to one of your, your beginning slides showing the, the reactivity to the peanut. Yeah, Beatty. Um, yeah, I saw that question. The Those skin tests, the only data we have really is the skin test reactivity. Um, as far as I'm aware, neither Cosby Stone nor John Hamler did any molecular um, analysis at the component level. Um, I, I could comment further on the whole issue of skin testing in relation to peanut. We were very surprised that the European extracts were highly, so highly enriched for RH2 and RH6. Um, in conversation with um, Dr. Paul Turner from Imperial College um, at the recent CIA meeting, um, he, Paul is running an immunotherapy trial using boiled peanut. And when I asked him about the source of the materials, he said, well, most, most peanuts in Europe either come from Australia or from China, uh, which was interesting to hear. Um, I'm not sure what the original source materials are for any of the commercial manufacturers that we showed data for. But this does raise an issue uh, and, and would explain potentially differences with um, extracts made in the US, which primarily come from the, the golden peanut company flour. The other thing I would say is that um, skin test reactivity of, you know, when we're talking 20, 30, 40 millimeters, that is really a potential risk for, for patients, especially children. Um, I would say, you know, when co one compares the allergen levels, we're talking one to three milligrams of allergens in these peanut extracts. And most standardized extracts, for example, dust mite and cat, we're talking about 10 to 50 micrograms per ml of, 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 of allergen. And so there is a difference, um, which I think is, is potentially clinically important. I don't think we need super concentrated extracts. I think partly the reason that happens is that unlike dust mite, for example, food source materials are in plentiful supply mm. um, and, and they're inexpensive, um, which may play into this uh, situation. The only other thing I'd mention is that the, our experience with peanuts suggests that we should also look at allergen levels in, in food uh, diagnostic skin tests, other food diagnostic skin test products, such as milk and egg and tree nuts and so on. Um, so I think there's plenty of, of work to do there. Um, the other thing I guess that I would emphasize is that the standardization, all the tools necessary for standardization are available. And we should be apply manufacturers um, um, and um, other, you know, regulators should be applying those tools to the standardization process. <laughs> Great, thanks, Martin. And a couple, several questions here on human IgE monoclonal antibodies. Uh, first, does InBio have any information on the cross reactivity of some of these uh, human IgE monoclonals? Yeah, that's a good question because um, most of them we have found them to be very highly specific, but some of them do cross-react, like for example, either within the same species, like for peanut, we will have one or few that will react to both RH2 and RH6. But for example, sometimes we have we find cross-reactivity between different species, like between their P, their F, and another species. So we know that, for example, 2F10 binds to uh, Abram2, their F2, their P2, but not to the storage mites. So yes, some of them are cross-reactive, but most of the others are very specific. Mm -hmm. Does InBio have any information on overlapping epitopes of the human IgE monoclonals? Yeah, actually, this is interesting because in top of doing the crystallographic analysis, we have done some NMR analysis. And in fact, uh, as I showed, we have two epitopes that have been defined by X-ray crystallography. But we also have three other um, antibodies to their P2 that we know they bind in the same area by NMR. Uh, and it's an overlapping area, but we know they bind differently. So yes, there are some that are overlapping, but kind of in the same area in this mm -hmm. case. For others, we don't know yet. To do crystallography, uh, we have it for their P2 and few others, but not for all of them. They're working mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. And this question is, is a bit related as well. Could the human IgE monoclonals be used for sequential IgE epitope mapping? Um, well, if those antibodies bind to a sequential epitope, yes, they will be able to be used for that. The ones that we know how they bind, they are all conformational. 
uh, they could bind to some parts of that conformational epitope, which is a linear epitope, but that we have not tested. But my bet is that most of them are conformational, at least from the knowledge from X-ray crystal structures, all of them. And we have a, a comment here. It takes a lot of work to do the characterization you have presented on a few allergens. Do you consider different proteins in the allergenic sources? The top two or four allergens, perhaps DURF and DURP have almost 40 proteins that are called allergens, yet it seems there are three major allergenic proteins in those mites. Yeah, thanks for this comment. This is, this is very interesting because it's true that most of the sources contain a lot of allergens. And what we try to obtain is IgS against the major ones. Uh, let's say for my DRP1, DRP2, DRP23, those are major. But I want to make the point that we don't select uh, what the specificity will be for those antibodies. I want to emphasize that those IgEs obtained by hybridoma technology are obtained from B cells. And B cells that produce Ig and are in very low frequency in blood, less than one per 10,000 uh, PBMCs. So at that low frequency, we get what we get. I mean, uh, we're happy to get what we get because it's very rare to get those antibodies. And once we get them, uh, then we screen them and we find out the specificity, not the other way around. So we don't know the specificity until the end of the, pro the process. And in most cases, it has turned out to be a major allergen, but we have some IgEs that would bind to several allergens. For example, from dog, we have some that bind to several allergens. So that's something that the specificity comes after the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, if I could just um, um, chip in there, Beatty, um, I think the, the issue is trying to define what's, what are the important allergens in source materials. Um, if we look at dust mite, for example, which was mentioned, we can measure DERP1 and DERP2 consistently. DERP23 is, is enigmatic because although it's a potent cause of sensitization, it's not present in very high concentrations, either in the mite extract or even we've had very diff great difficulty detecting it in house dust extracts. And so I think this is a, there's a potential opportunity, really, when one can look at um, one to three or four immunoassays, um, as we've done with peanut. Um, but then it's a, there's also a potential to do the standardization or, or assessment of other proteins using mass spec. So that's a good example of where you could potentially combine um, both the immunoassay methods, which are really needed to demonstrate um, immunological reactivity of the, of the product, um, and mass spec, which can also add to the, to the um, um, assessment on a, on a protein basis. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether Sabina has any comments with that, but yeah. Um, uh, yeah. We pretty much just our, um, what we purify as natural or recombinant allergens is mostly, mostly based on the need for molecular allergy diagnostics. And, and we um, try to have as many um, relevant proteins for molecular diagnostics available as, as we can work in our pipeline. Mm -hmm. Great. <clears throat> Sabina, I think that's a great segue uh, to some some allergen questions that are coming in now. Okay. Um, how is the consistency between different lots of purified allergens determined? Um, so we, first of all, we are ISO certified, which means we use the same standard operating procedure to purify um, the allergen, which means that the, even if it's a different person, they use the same protocol. We try to have the same source material available for several years, so we buy larger lots, and so we have consistency there used when we purify natural allergens. And then we have, um, essentially, we compare the QC items, like do we get comparable um, chromat uh, chromatograms for HPLC? Do we get the same um, presentation by SAS page? And do we get the same purity by mass spec? And do we get the same reactivity by ELISA? There's also the things we uh, look at, and we have essentially one person who does a purification and compares it to the previous purification protocol. And then we have a person who does a final QC who compares it to the uh, previous log protocol. So there's a lot of checks and balances involved. And reasons to reject a lot would be if we see any kind of degradation by SAS page, if we don't see reactivity by ELISA, or if the purity is um, 
under 95% by mass spec. Great. Thank you. What what is the typical stability of in bios allergens? So we we run a, a real time stability at the uh, recommended storage temperature of minus twenty degrees, and over ninety percent of the allergens have a five year stability at minus twenty. There's a few exceptions where we have a shelf life of um, three years, and then the group one uh, natural dust mite allergens they have a stability of one year. Mm -hmm. Can you calculate allergen composition based on moles of protein in addition to mass? So all of our calculations are based on mass. I think to accurately do that by moles, um, we would have to use a labeled um, protein or, or peptides, and which we have not done. So all of our calculations are, are relative abundance based. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I have a Bouncing back to the human IgE here, for monoclonal IgE, you showed comparisons of pooled monoclonals with human serum pool. For some foods, you only have one monoclonal available. Have you compared single monoclonal antibody inhibition with human serum pool? Do you expect it to be significantly less than the human serum pool? No, we have not compared a single monoclonal antibody to a pool. Uh, the one, the results I showed were just the first study we have done comparing pools. My assumption is that if you only use one antibody instead of a pool, it will be less similar to the the, sera, the human sera, which by nature is made of a mixture of several antibodies. Uh, as you know, it's polyclonal IG. So... This is something that is in the future. We're going to try more of these uh, comparisons, and we certainly are going to try single uh, antibodies. So we're planning to do these studies ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Martin, this might be going back to your, your presentations. Is there data supporting the assumption that testing or treating with peanut allergen enriched for RH2 and RH6 is more dangerous than using standardized peanut allergen with more consistent levels of RH1, 2, 3, and 6? Well, um, I hate to use the word dangerous. Um, <laughs> uh, that has lots of connotations. I think that um, 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 I'm not sure what the data is. On, uh, certainly, for example, um, we know that um, uh, the only FDA-approved pro product, Palforsia, um, has more consistent levels of these fo the, the uh, four major allergens from peanut. And I guess I should respond to some of the other comment in that we know with peanut that these four allergens comprise 90% of the peanut protein that's been studied uh, by the FDA using mass spec several years ago. So I think that... Um, um, you know, there is a, a sense in which, you know, we know that more than 50% of patients are sensitized to RH1 and RH3. And so it would make sense, perfect sense to actually include these in a therapeutic extract. Um, and then so there does become a question about whether um, extracts that are either uh, enriched for, which we don't actually think is happening, we think it's a source material, whether they are truly representative of of a profile and certainly you know we we work with as you know a lot of food therapeutics companies in preclinical studies um, and our advice to them would be to try to develop a consistent profile around all of the four major peanut allergens uh, i think this also applies for example with with other allergens such as egg and, and possibly milk where one would try to identify several allergens that would provide the basis for that standardization mm -hmm. And in bio comment on the cost effectiveness effectiveness of allergen standardization. For example, when a pharma company is developing a food allergen immunotherapy to phase three, they must rigorously standardize the allergen to commercial scale. And this has been a barrier uh, to entry, it seems. Um, I don't know if we, we have any comments on, you know, the cost effectiveness of, of doing this testing. Well, I would say that the cost that the, the cost of the testing itself um, is minimal compared to the other costs of recruiting patients into study and doing, you know, particularly phase two and phase three clinical trials. Um, at the same time, we know that sort of food allergy has become an increasing problem, 
Um, and there are lots of companies now that are trying to develop new to new 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 approaches to therapeutics um, using virus-like particles or ways of administration of allergen into the skin directly um, to to do that. And so um, I, I don't th I, I think that you, you know as with all pharmaceutical products, um, you know precise and accurate and reproducible me measurements of the the active pharmaceutical ingredient, the API, is the principle that we need to apply to food therapeutics as medicines. Um, and so based on that um, um, approach, um, um, uh, that, 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 that is where the standardization comes in. And I guess I should say that the, the only FDA approved product, um, Palforzia, has been standardized using that approach. It's, and it's got to market and, and it's approved by the FDA. So I think that I appreciate. Well, we appre we all appreciate the the costs of doing clinical trials, which are which are pr pretty horrendous. Um, um, I don't think the, the the standardization is essential to have those trials go ahead. Um, even for example, for research studies, the research studies that are being done now um, by NIH and other agencies, we need to have standardized product at the get go in those studies. Um, um, because if there are problems arise later on, you don't want to be going back to what what the way you, you know to, to to look at the original extracts that we used to begin with in the clinical trial. So I I, I um, while I appreciate the 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 um, obvious um, um, issues on the costs of clinical trials, um, I I think I don't think standardization is a significant part of that. Great, thanks, Martin. Anna, uh, how do we find important allergenic epitopes? Well, one of the ways is uh, like I was showing in those experiments, we know, for example, an uh, epitope by its recrystallograph, we mutate it, so it no longer binds the IgE. And then with the mutant, we prove that by inhibition assays, that it, it doesn't bind as well as the wild type. And if we prove that for a big population like we showed here for 10 patients, that means it's a dominant epitope in that population. So it's a whole process. It's not a simple process. And that's how we found two important epitopes on the P2. So it requires a bit of, uh, quite a bit of uh, experimental work because uh, at least to do it right, this crystallography gives us the base for mutagenesis analysis. And that's how we found out if they are important or not. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Welcome. Any explanation for the high prevalence of IgE-mediated med food allergy in the last couple of decades? Any suggestion of the increasing amount of immunizations given to young children, for example? Um, I think, I mean, that's a very interesting question. I think there's lots of us would like potentially to know the answer to that about the increased prevalence of food allergy. Um, I must say that, you know, uh, from a personal perspective, growing up in, in England in the um, um, in the 60s and 70s, um, peanut allergy was was not not significant. In fact, most of us didn't eat peanut butter and we, we thought peanut butter and jelly was something of an aberration, really, an, <laughs> an American thing. Um, but now, of course, the, the use of food products, uh, peanut allergy has become incredibly prevalent in the UK. Um, as has the consumption of peanut butter and other products. Um, and so I do think that, that that the global spread of different kinds of food products um, may be contributing to that, as well as improved um, diagnostic um, 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 procedures that we have uh, now that are currently available. Great. Thanks, Martin. I think we have time for one more question here. Uh, the enriched concentration of RH2 and RH6 in European extracts versus those made in the U.S. is also concerning from a preclinical research standpoint in context of allergen-specific monoclonal IgG therapeutic approaches. Would you consider the in-bio peanut flour product more physiological relevant for use in preclinical allergic effector cell assays since RH1 and 3 are more abundant in peanut as compared to RH2 and 6. So ending on a doozy here. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, do you have a, a comment on that? I, 
Well, I'd say, of course. <laughs> 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 no, I, you know, I, I think that these are four major allergens and that, that um, you know, one um, to have. I mean, literally, um, some of the extracts you're talking about 10 to 100 fold differences in the ratios. And, and that, I think, should be something that should be be looked at. Um, and maybe Sabina can comment a little bit on on uh, our particular um, peanut material. Um, but I, I, I guess that my, my thought is really that that was not done necessarily. It was designed. It wasn't done by design. We didn't just suddenly say we need a peanut material that does this. I think we 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 tested the material that was obtained from bird uh, bird mill and also from golden peanut. And that's how it came out. Is, is that right, Sabina? That's correct. In fact, bird's mill was just a smaller quantity um, of the golden peanut uh, light roast um, peanut flour that was uh, available to purchase at a half a pound or a pound rather than 50 pound bag. And um, this is our source material that we use to purify natural RH2 and RH6. Um, so since we have the extract, we thought it would be nice to um, just have that as a product. We have five different assays to, um, ELISA assays to measure peanut allergens. So we put them to a good use and we analyze this as a kind of um, reference standard. And yes, we consistently find very high levels of RH3. Um, and, and that was different from the, and the, and the extracts that Martin presented. <laughs> Whether it seemed to be enriched for RH two and six, and, mm -hmm. and RH three was rather low, so um, that was very different. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Well, thank you all, and I think that's wraps us up. We have hit our time for the webinar, but appreciate everyone uh, attending today, and um, we'll be following up with a recording of this webinar to all registrants, but. You know, uh, there's certainly a significant interest in this topic as questions continue to roll in. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, uh, we're happy to help however possible. With that, we'll close the webinar and see you on the next one. Thanks. Great. Thank you, guys. Bye. Right, bye. bye.